Here are some audio extracts from a new booklet by Tony Brooks about the history of King Edward Mine. We're fortunate to have a historical record of activities on surface and underground at this unique former mine, created by some pioneers of early photography. The booklet will be available to purchase from the museum shop as soon as we are able to open again. Between 1893 and about 1905, photography pioneers John Charles Burrow and Herbert Hughes took the whole series of photographs, both on surface and underground at KEM. As a result, King Edward Mine is one of the most photographed mines in Cornwall. At the end of the 19th century, students at the Camborne School of Mines spent much of their time doing practical mining and trim dressing work in the local mines. South Kandara Mine, being close to Camborne and quite shallow, was used extensively in this way. In the early 1890s, the Cornish mining industry was almost in terminal decline and the surviving mines were foiling behind technically. This was hardly ideal from the instruction point of view. In 1896, the case was made for the school to have its own underground mine. South Kandara was about finished as a commercial concern and in 1897, the school took over the abandoned eastern portion of the mine around engine shaft. This offered the opportunity to work both Williams load and the great flat load down to the 40 fathom level, around 400 feet from surface. No pumping was necessary as all water in the mine drained into the then working deeper Will Grenville mine to the south. The mine in the period between 1897 and 1906 under the direction of William Thomas, head of mining and surveying at CSM, engine shaft and William shaft were re-equipped, the underground workings cleared and a number of surface buildings erected, including a complete modern full-scale tin dressing plant, survey office, workshops and lecture rooms. The original count house, mine offices, and change house facilities were retained. The mine was operated semi-commercially and produced tin on a regular basis, employing some 10 to 20 men, in addition to the school's teaching staff. Most of the production work was carried out by students. In 1901, it was renamed King Edward Mine. The depths of levels at King Edward would originally have been measured in fathoms, confusingly not measured from surface but from adit level. That was about 26 fathoms or 160 feet below surface. So adit was 160 feet below surface, 10 fathom level 220 feet, 20 fathom level 280 feet, 30 fathom level 340 feet and the 40 fathom level 400 feet. The flat load was one of Cornwall's major ore bodies, but the payable ore tended to occur in chutes separated by sub-economic zones. It was a wide structure that resulted in large excavations where it was extracted. The load was all of eight feet thick and had a relatively shallow dip. A new drawing or survey office had been completed by the middle of 1898. The building has little changed today. The wooden head frame at the top of engine shaft was erected in 1904, before the days of the mobile crane. After underground operations were transferred to Great Kandara Mine, the head frame collapsed and was never replaced. All of the mill machinery, including the stamps, was driven by a horizontal steam engine in the mill engine room. This was a 90 horsepower compound steam engine made by Holman Brothers of Camborne. A belt passed down into the mill and drove the mill machinery. The engine was scrapped in the early 1930s when the mill was electrified and the space was later converted into a lecture room. It currently houses the museum. The cage in the western compartment of engine shaft allowed three miners to be lowered into the mine. There was 
a simple safety bar across the width of the cage. It would have been a damp and rattly ride down to the working levels. The cage only illuminated by the light of a candle or two, that is, if they had not blown out or been put out by a droplet of water. An old man called the lander rang the cage away and held the knocker line or bell wire in his hand. Pulling this line would tr transmit a signal to the winder driver via a mechanical linkage. A code of signals would have been set up by the mine manager with copies posted in the winder house, at the shaft top and at each level underground. When not used for man riding, the cage was also used to hoist haul. The cage would take one loaded wagon. The mine manager, William Thomas, and two of his daughters were photographed outside the count house in 1904. Early photographs of women going underground in Cornwall can be counted on the fingers of two hands. No doubt many did go underground as visitors, but did not arrive with a photographer to record the event. Rock drills. Students would have been exposed both to the traditional method of hand drilling and the more modern rock drilling machines. Hand drilling was still very common in Cornish mines at this time. Despite William Thomas's efforts to be up to date, it was used extensively at King Everett Mine, as the mine only had three rock drills. The rock drills, the rock drill was mounted on a cradle on a jack bar and arm, as it is too heavy to hold by hand. The machine, which is rotative percussive, similar to today's, today's domestic hammer drills, was forwarded by a manual screw, which the miner operated with his left hand. A lad behind the machine would hold a water spray, which was supposed to help to control the dust. A high speed machine like this will crush chippings in the hole to a fine dust before it has a chance to escape out of the hole. This very fine dust, only a few microns in size, if it contains silica, caused silicosis, a potentially fatal lung condition. Today, the modern rock drill has the facility to pass water through the drill steel to the end hole, thus wetting any dust before it has a chance to escape to the atmosphere. Blasting. Miners worked as a pair or team of miners. When the fuses were lit for a blast, they would have retreated to safety. After the blast, the dust and fumes would be allowed to clear before the men returned. They would first make the place safe, checking and barring down any loose rock. Because of the unusually flat dip of the load, then the ore would have to be helped down the slope of the load to the lower level and then shoveled into wagons. The wagon, once filled, would have been hand-trammed along the level to the shaft. At the shaft, the wagon would have been pushed into the cage, secured, and then hoisted to surface. Miners underground typically wore a resin-impregnated felt hard hat. The candle was held by wrapping a ball of clay around it. This sticky clay, which came from a pit on the side of St Agnes Beacon, was used to attach the candle to the hat when the miners needed both hands free. Tramming. Whilst all of the levels below adits at King Edward were in granite, ground conditions were patchy and some areas required support. Timber support was the exception rather than the rule in Cornish mines in the granite. Because of the steep dip of William's load, unlike the flat load, the broken ore from the stopes could be loaded through chutes directly into wagons. In reality, these little chutes, often referred to as cousin jack chutes, are difficult to control. The rock tends either to jam somewhere up in the chute or comes pouring down uncontrollably all over the wagon and onto the floor of the level. Chutes of this type continue to be used in the Cornish mines up until the late 1980s. On surface, an elevated tramway had been constructed, linking the head frame with the mill. From the cage, 
the wagon could be trammed directly into the mill to be dumped into an ore bin above the stamps. This was an efficient layout that eliminated any unnecessary handling between the stope and the mill. The Miner's Dry, described in the Mining Journal of March 1903. The changing house is fitted up in a style which might, with advantage, be copied by other mines. Instead of drying with hot hair, or hot air, the central tube is one long boiler supplying hot water for eight or nine plunge baths which occupy two sides of the two sides, while a second or smaller pipe supplies cold water. In addition to plunges, there are two shower baths, so that in this respect, and as a vital one, the students of Camborne School enjoyed very special advantages. Nor is the well-being of the practical miners who share the underground work of the students lost sight of, for their changing house too is fitted with hot and cold water of both of which there is abundant supply. The building still survives, though it has been altered to become commercial workspace. The underground operations were transferred to Great Kandura, and South Kandura is no longer accessible underground. However, all the surface buildings at King Edward Mine have survived. They have been recognized as being of national importance by English heritage who have listed them as Grade 2 Star. We hope you will be able to enjoy the remarkable photos in this book when it is available for sale. In the meantime, you might also enjoy King Edward Mines' YouTube channel with videos of our historic working machinery. Best regards from the trustees and volunteers of King Edward Mine. Thank you to our presenters, David Ager, Maureen Gilbert, Graham Sowell and Tony Bunt. The recording across the internet and production was by Carol Richards in April 2020.